Juliana Soltis is a cellist who specializes in music of the Baroque, which coincides with the rise of the cello as a solo instrument. In her debut album, which goes by the provocative title of Entre le Diable, or Enter the Devil, Juliana documents some of the early and somewhat even controversial works for the instrument. I spoke with Juliana recently about the album, her debut recording, in fact, from the Asus record label. Now, the first thing that struck me in looking at your bio was that it says you were raised among the rich musical traditions of Appalachia. And I have to say, I doubt that the French Baroque repertoire was uh, one of those traditions. And, and I wonder if you can tell us how you discovered the Baroque repertoire, what it is that you love about it so much. Well, it's true that French Baroque music is is pretty far away from Appalachian music. But surprisingly, there are, there are some real similarities. Um, people forget that the colonists who came to the New World from Europe were essentially playing Baroque music, and they brought those traditions with them. And so there's a really interesting connections between Baroque music and, say, traditional Appalachian music. But I came to Baroque music uh, through a very circuitous path, actually, um, most people who knew me in my my student days knew me as someone who was very much into contemporary music, like the newer, the weirder, the better. But I had always loved Baroque music. I had always loved Bach. And it was one of those constant currents in my, my life as I went through all of those you know, changes that I think anybody does in, in their teens and their 20s where I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and what I wanted to do with these talents that I have. And it was a little like, you know, that person, like that really good friend in your life, who you're like, oh, it's just, it's, it's so bad that I don't have those kind of feelings for them. And, and then one day you turn around and realize that you've been madly in love the entire time. And that, that was kind of how it was for me in Baroque music. Yeah. Give us a little backstory now on how this album in particular came about. This is your your debut album, right? Yes. How did it happen? Uh, again, in kind of a, a circuitous way. Um, I was working uh, while a student at, at Oberlin Conservatory doing my second master's degree. I was a was a research gremlin basically, and I worked down in the <laughs> in the basement. You you were down in the chamber of musical secrets, weren't you? Yes, I was. <laughs> You never know what you might find in the basement, as we right. all know. Um, and I found this treatise, this book, um, and it's really small, like quite small. It's uh, no bigger than than my hand from the base of my, my palm to the tips of my fingers, to just give you an, an idea. And it was titled, A Defense of the Bass Vial Against the Pretensions of the Cello. And I thought, oh, well, <laughs> that sounds scandalous and interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and it was written in French, and and luckily French is is a language that I speak, and I was going through it and reading through it when I should have been working, and realized that there was a moment in time where the cello very suddenly became popular as a solo instrument in France, and that not everybody was was happy about it. In fact, some people saw it as a real threat to French musical identity. And so I started looking for repertoire from this period. And what I found were these wildly experimental and incredibly virtuosic pieces. And I fell in love with this music. Now, this is where the title of the album comes from, right? Because the title is in French, and it's Entre le Diable. That means enter the devil, right? Yes. And so now that's inspired by this treatise in defense of the bass viol. Yes, there's a really wonderful line at, at which point, and the author, Hubert Leblanc, who's a jurist, you know, he's a, essentially a lawyer, uh, says, you know, calls the cello, you know, a, a, I think a, a miserable wretch. The canker and the, and the poor devil, and it's like wow. <laughs> there, there was a real rivalry, I guess, at least in this person's mind. I mean, it, it, you know, right, images of a sort of a cage match between the viol players and the <laughs> cello players comes to mind. We have those all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were Were you playing Baroque 
cello then? Did you have an instrument in hand when when you discovered this uh, little treatise, or, or did it kind of spur you into experimenting a little bit more and finding out more about it? I was playing Baroque cello already at this point, and um, when I was playing modern cello, I was lucky enough to purchase an antique instrument that I then had restored and is now my, my Baroque cello. But what discovering this treatise and discovering this repertoire really did for me was to push me in a direction that guides my, my career, that guides my, my work, which is to say that I'm really passionate about uncovering those moments in music history that have been forgotten or neglected or marginalized by the canonical view, which is to say the accepted view of music history. And there's nothing really sinister there in, in saying that these, these things have been forgotten. You know, in, in any history, what's written down in the books is, you know, just sort of we've agreed that these are the most important things and, and this is what we're going to teach. So it's going back and finding all the other pieces that give you a more complete sense or a fuller picture of Western music. Now, it should be said that the Baroque cello is very different from the modern cello. It sounds completely uh, different, not at all what we come to expect. We can talk about the sound of it, but it might make more sense to listen to a little bit of it, just because the modern cello is in many people's ears. Not so much the, the Baroque cello, which has a very different sound. And as I take it, put a lot of different demands on you physically to play this uh, this repertoire. So we'll talk about that as well. But I want to play just a little bit of the uh, sonata by uh, Martin Berthaud, the French composer. And the reason I chose this is because I'm really struck by the melody at the very beginning, which reminds me so much of that aria, Caro Mio Ben. Do you know that aria? No, I don't think I do. Oh, yeah. Of course, uh, Berto died before Caro Mio Ben was composed, so <laughs> <laughs> we can tell which came from where. But let's listen to it for a minute, and I want you to tell us about the difference between the Baroque cello and the regular cello. Sure. First of all, do you like listening to yourself? <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. it's, it's difficult to listen to myself, I think, because the instinct is there after years of study to um, look for what I would do differently or what I think could be better and revisiting or listening to, to what something that I recorded, you know, over a year ago is, is always is tough because... You think, oh, I, I would do that differently now, or oh, I could play that better now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about that that cello sound. Mm -hmm. It's very different from the kind of deep, rich uh, cello sound that we're accustomed to nowadays. It's a little, I don't know, what kind of adjectives would you use to to describe the Baroque cello sound? Well, Baroque cellos um, are entirely different animals than modern cellos, and that's in part because of the spaces they were played in. As a modern cellist, you're often playing in really large concert halls, and so your m major concern is projecting sound so that everybody, no matter where they're sitting in the hall, can, can hear the music that they came to hear. And a Baroque cello, Baroque instruments, were meant to be played in smaller settings. They're being played in salons and palaces, or they're being played in, in churches, which of course are naturally very resonant. And a Baroque cello is supposed to create clouds of sound. The sound is supposed to be very resonant. It should glow. I often like to describe it as a sound that can populate a room, creates a real atmosphere for listeners to dwell in, rather than creating a directional sound that's meant to punch through 
you know, to the cheap seats at the back of the hall. Or it doesn't have to sing over an orchestra either. No, or the orchestras are much smaller. When you're talking about a Baroque orchestra, you know, you've got maybe two other cellos to fight against, whereas in a modern orchestra, yeah. you're talking about eight to ten. <laughs> So in this uh, album that you have, you, you document uh, lots of different aspects of the Baroque cello, but sort of the, the, the genesis of the Baroque cello with the music of uh, Salvatore Lanzetti, correct? Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us the story b behind that and what he did to uh, contribute to the repertoire? Oh, sure. This is, this is such a good story. So, of course, the French had the cello since, I'd say, the 16th century, but the cello was considered to be a very low instrument. It's not a noble instrument. It's something that you play to accompany like really rough dancing. And what they have instead of the cello for playing high art music, for playing solos, is the viola da gamba. And the French hold on to the viola da gamba far longer than anywhere else in Europe. When other countries like Italy and Germany have abandoned the viol, in favor of the cello, the French are still writing incredibly virtuosic works for it. And in part, that's because of the influence of you know Louis XIV, who during his incredibly long reign uh, really tries to, to codify what it means to be French in terms of French language and literature and, and, and music. So they hold on to the viol and it becomes very identified with the French. And then Louis dies. And all of a sudden, all things Italian become incredibly incredibly popular in, in Paris, including mm. the music of Vivaldi. And so Lanzetti, in 1736, becomes the first cellist to perform at the Concert Spirituel. And the Concert Spirituel in itself is important because it's one of the first public concert series in existence. So we're not playing at the palace. We're playing in a, in a public venue that almost anybody can come to. And Lanzetti's performance so scandalizes and excites people in Paris that what we see in France after that performance, or actually after those two performances he gave too, is an explosion of creativity at the instrument. Previously, we're not seeing works for the cello being written in, in France or exclusively for the cello in France. And all of a sudden there's this outpouring of, of creativity and it's not just that they're writing pieces. It's that they are experimenting with how far can we take the capabilities of the instrument in a way that I have not encountered during in any other repertoire from this same period in any other country. Let's talk about a couple of other pieces on the desk. My attention was caught by your program notes here, which are extremely interesting and uh, detailed. And when you talk about things like having to bandage up your chin because <laughs> you had to use your chin instead of your <laughs> fingers, and uh, you just tell us some of the physical travails that you had to go through to, to record this music. Oh, sure. The chin is definitely a, a big one, and... Um, it's something that a lot of performers think is, is a joke. So in this, I should back up a little bit. In this, this piece by uh, Francois Martin, there is an indication. It's on the second page of the first movement. And it says menton. And what menton means in, in French, it means chin. And what he wants you to do is to take your, your chin and place it on the fingerboard and use your chin to depress the strings rather than your finger. And so while you're chin is holding down a low note you take your left hand further up the instrument and you play high notes and you're playing this this wonderful ar arpeggio with your your chin down on on the instrument and um <laughs> i'm just trying to picture this right now it's I, I mean, quite a contortion i guess it helps to have a pointy chin i don't know I think it helped mostly to have kind of a, a bony chin because uh, yeah. I found that uh, I, to get a really good sound, I actually needed to connect my jawbone with with the fingerboard. And um, 
It was one of those moments. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> we, we need some pictures of that oh, uh, process. Oh, I think somebody has some that I may have told them, don't you dare ever show anyone those pictures. <laughs> um, but it, it was a little unpleasant at first, and, and definitely I had to, um, you know, the Band-Aids uh, were, were quite necessary for the first, I'd say, like month that I was, was working on, on the piece because it was just tearing up the skin. I'm envisioning an entire album here of chin pieces. <laughs> Yeah, I should could, commission uh, some. Explore that avenue. Or not, you know. <laughs> may want to preserve uh, what chin you have left <laughs> after that. Now, you experimented with the the Boeing, right? And I think people don't, you know, in the category of things that people don't think about in playing the cello, the Boeing is very important, even more so in, in Baroque uh, cello. Can you talk about that for us? Oh, absolutely. Um, bow technique, I think, is really what defines Baroque playing um, and separates it not only from, say, romantic and, and modern playing, because the bow, when you're playing Baroque music, is meant to be very rhetorical. And all that means, really, is that what we're trying to achieve with the bow is something akin to speech patterns. So, you know, when you speak a sentence, your voice goes up a little bit and it goes down and you have a little die off towards the end of the sentence. We're trying to recreate that kind of tonality i suppose when when we're bowing and it's very interesting and it's very beautiful but what most people don't realize is that there was no one way to bow during the baroque period much as we think of the cello as you know the instrument that we see in the modern orchestra we also think that okay everybody you know bows the same way they hold the bow more or less the same way all bows look the same but during the Baroque period, people were experimenting, again, with, with how do we hold the bow and, and what kinds of sounds can we achieve. And there were actually a number of cellists who probably started out as viol players who bowed the cello underhanded, as if it were a viol. And Berto, according to sort of stories that have been passed down, was one of those people. And so when I decided that I was going to play one of his pieces, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to teach myself to, to bow the cello underhanded because I, I play viol and you think, all right, you know, big deal. I just pull out the viol bow and I'm going to just play the cello like it's a viol. And had another one of those, oh, what was I thinking, kind of moments <laughs> when I started doing it because the sound was not what I was expecting at all. And I thought, oh, I just, I hate this. How am I, how am I going to tell my producer? But how does that affect the sound though? Does it, is it, harder to control? Can you not get as much pressure on the bow? It's that it just sounds completely different because you're exerting pressure on the string in a different way. And as cellists, mm. and certainly for me, um, you know, I've been playing the cello for, for over 20 years, and I think I know what a cello is supposed to sound like. And mm -hmm. I think I know what a good sound is. You know, I've got you know, all these degrees and years of experience, and so you think that you know. And that's sort of, I think, the, the, the key idea there is that you think you know. Right. And I finally realized as I was sort of just going back and forth, like, oh, no, oh, oh, am I going to do this? Am I not going to do this? The epiphany moment for me was when I realized that I was not allowing for a sound that was different. I was not allowing for the fact that people in the 18th century may have had a very different idea than I have in the 21st century of what a beautiful sound is. And the yeah. minute that I let that go, that I thought I knew what I was trying to achieve and just observed what was happening and experimented with what I had in, in front of me, that, that really wonderful, beautiful things started to happen. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. Do people play this repertoire on modern instruments, or, or do they usually gravitate towards a period instrument for performance? I would say that, um, in general, the repertoire, this repertoire isn't played very much. If anything that's on the disc is played, it's usually barrière. Um, mm -hmm. his, his pieces are really, really wonderfully well written and so much fun to play and I think are a little more approachable 
for a lot of cellists because they don't have those those crazy things in it like you know play with your chin or, <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. Your, um, your toes on the fingerboard. Or yes, whatever. that's for the next album. Um, well, the reason I ask is, is because I'm wondering uh, what your opinion is of, of this kind of music and Baroque music being played on modern instruments. You know, we have like Bach harpsichord works being played on the piano mm. and, and you know, the cello suites being played on the modern cello. Do you think that it loses something without uh, trying to approximate what it sounded like back in the day? You know, that's a really good question, and it's certainly something that I know people feel very strongly about, and I am I'm going to incur some wrath for saying this, but I love this music so much that what I want more than anything is to see and hear other cellists playing it so if a modern cellist wants to pick up the Maltin and they want to play it in a modern way, I say, go right ahead. I prefer to play it in an historical style, but I don't want to say to someone, if you're not going to do this in an historical style, you shouldn't do it at all. Because then you're you're sort of shutting that door for them that could lead to, you know, greater discovery. <laughs> But what I really like to do is to evoke an era, you know, to transport people back, but not take them out of the 21st century, you know, to give them a chance to visit and maybe forge some connections between that time and our own. You know, you often hear uh, from people, they're like, I just, I don't get that music. It's, it's, it's too old. You know, it's very far removed. We, you know, we can get you know sort of up in arms about it as, as classical musicians and say, oh, but it's universal. Well, sure, but you know, two hundred some years—that's a really long time, and and things have changed a lot. And if you really want to understand a music, I think you need to understand the time, and then for listeners to draw parallels between that time and and our own time, and suddenly that light bulb goes on for people, and oh. You know, they're so upset about the cello the way, you know, people were really upset about, you know, rock and roll when it was new or, or times when people have been really upset about, you know, a rap disc that comes out. Um, you know, there's that, that wonderful saying, everything old is new again. <laughs> well, that kind of also um, maybe explains the connection between contemporary music and, and Baroque music. Yes. Oh, I absolutely agree. And, and um, I've been asked before. You know, how could I, as somebody who was so interested in contemporary music, then go into early music for my career? And, you know, there's actually a, a lot of similarities, particularly that what I'm trying to achieve in performance and in recording the disc is to bring that music back to a feeling of being something brand new. What was it like when it was basically the avant-garde of, of French music and regain that sense of, of excitement and, and to pass that on to the listeners. Cellist Juliana Soltis, whose debut album is called Entre le Diable or Enter the Devil. It documents the rise of the virtuoso cello during pre-revolutionary France. That's on the Asus record label, and we will link to it from our website at wgte.org. And Juliana, where can uh, folks connect with you uh, on the web or on social media if they want to learn more about you and, and this album? Oh, sure. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I have a professional page that's Juliana Soltis, Baroque Cellist. And I actually spend a good amount of time on, on Instagram if you want to see pictures from my travels all around the globe. And that's Juliana Soltis underscore Baroque Cello. Are we going to see any chin pictures, bandaged chin pictures on Instagram? You know, I think there might be one up there. <laughs> I'll have to go back and check. <laughs> the folks will, will flock there, I'm sure, and go digging <laughs> through the uh, the photographs. Juliana Soltis, who joined us today from uh, West Virginia. Uh, you're visiting your parents down there, I understand. Yep. And yeah, what do they think of your Baroque obsession? <laughs> I, I think that my parents are just glad that I can, you know, pay the rent and, and that I'm not starving. Um, but um, <laughs> in honesty, they've always been incredibly supportive. So I'm, yeah. I'm very grateful. Well, that's wonderful. Glad to hear it. So congratulations on this uh, new album, your debut recording. And I want to thank you for spending time with us today here on FM91. Well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, 